بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما so last week we started talking about some of the events and incidents that happened after the battle of Al-Khandaq. And we talked about how the Prophet ﷺ started sending expeditions to the different tribes that participated against the Muslims in the battle of Khandaq to punish those tribes. So today, inshallah, we will continue to talk about some of the events and incidents that happened following the battle of Al-Khandaq. One of those incidents was known as Ghazwat al ghaba also known as Ghazwat the qird And this Ghazwa was under the command of the Prophet ﷺ himself, and that is why it is called a Ghazwa. If you remember from before, we said that if an expedition is led by the Prophet ﷺ himself personally, it is known as a Ghazwa. And if the Prophet ﷺ himself is not there, but he puts it under the command of one of his companions, it is known as a Sariya. So this was a Ghazwa known as Ghazwat al ghaba also known as Ghazwat the qird It was under the command of the Prophet ﷺ himself. And it was between the Muslims and the tribe of Ghatafan. And you are hearing this name a lot, the tribe of Ghatafan. This is a tribe that's always making problems with the Muslims. And they were also one of the tribes that participated against the Muslims in the battle of Al-Khandaq. So now again, this expedition, Ghazwat al ghaba or Ghazwat the qird it is against the tribe of Ghatafan. So the tribe of Ghatafan were very upset that they didn't benefit financially at all from the battle of Khandaq. The reason why they joined the alliance with the confederation at the Battle of Al-Khandaq was because they thought that this was an easy victory and they would be able to collect a good amount of spoils of the war. So the tribe of Ghatafan was a tribe that actually lived on invading other tribes and collecting the spoils of war. So there were many tribes among the Arabs that were like this. Their whole economy was based on this, invading other tribes and collecting the spoils of the war. So their whole financial situation was based upon this type of activity. So Ghatafan, they were very accept, uh, they were very upset that they were not able to collect anything from the Battle of Khandaq and they went back home as losers. So they were also upset that the deal that they tried to make with the Prophet ﷺ at Al-Khandaq, they were negotiating a deal with the Prophet ﷺ before the Battle of Al-Khandaq was over. They were negotiating a deal where they would agree to back off. They would agree to leave the confederation in return for receiving one third of the fruits of Medina. So the Prophet ﷺ was actually negotiating this deal with them. But then Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh radiallahu an, he said to the Prophet ﷺ, Ya Rasulullah, don't make this deal with them. We don't need to make any deal with them. So the Prophet ﷺ, he accepted this advice of Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh and that deal fell through. It never came about. So Ghatafan, they got nothing. And they went back home with nothing. So they were very upset about this because they were really expecting to collect a big amount of the spoils of war. And they were excited about that. But when they went back home, they had nothing. So this anger and this disappointment was still there in, in their hearts. And they already had enmity for the Muslims even from before that. So they were very bitter. So the leader of Ghatafan, he was a man named Uyayna ibn Hisn. Uyayna ibn Hisn, the leader of Ghatafan. And he is a person that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam nicknamed Al-Ahmaq Al-Muta'. Al-Ahmaq Al-Muta'. Al-Ahmaq is a fool. And Al-Muta' means someone who is obeyed. So he is a fool, but still he is obeyed by his people because of his power, because of his position of authority. So Uyayna ibn Hisn was known as Al-Ahmaq Al-Muta', a fool who is obeyed by his people. So his decisions were idiotic, this man. Even though he was the leader of his people, he didn't know how to lead. He didn't know how to rule. So he would make idiotic decisions. But his people would still obey him because of fear and because he was in a position of power and authority. So it was said 
about this man, Uyayna ibn Husn al ahmaq al Mutar. If he were to ask 10,000 soldiers, now Ghatafan, it's a huge tribe. So it was said about Uyayna ibn Husn, if he were to ask 10,000 soldiers to mobilize and move forward, they would do it without asking where or why. They would just follow his command without even questioning him at all. They wouldn't even ask, where are we going? Why are we doing this? No. If he told them to do it, they would do it. So he was obeyed by his people, even though he was a fool. So Uyayna ibn Husn, he sent a group of horsemen under the leadership of his own son. His own son was Fuzara ibn Uyayna ibn Husn. So he sent this group of horsemen, these soldiers on horse under the leadership of Fuzara ibn Uyayna, his own son. And he sent them with the instructions to go to Medina. But not really with the purpose of actually fighting and killing people or taking over Medina, nothing like that. But the intention was just to steal whatever you can. Steal animals, steal fruit, steal whatever you can and come back. And if you have to kill anyone in the process while doing that, then yeah, go ahead and kill people. But the main purpose was not to kill people. The main purpose was actually just to steal whatever they could. So these horsemen, they reached an area right by the outskirts of Medina. And this area was known as Mantaka al Ghaba, the area of what can be translated loosely as the forest. So basically it was an area right on the outskirts of Medina. It was an area that had lots of, of trees and it was an area of farmland and agriculture. So the animals, they used to graze there. And it was a, a place basically where the farmers would graze their animals and they would, they would grow fruits and stuff like that. So when the army of Ghatafan reached Al Ghaba, they reached this place by the outskirts of Al Medina, they found what they were looking for. They found camels, they found sheep, they found fruits. And this is exactly what they wanted to steal. So in that area at that time, when the horsemen of Ghatafan arrived, there was a Muslim farmer that was there in that area at that time and his wife. So there was a Muslim farmer and his wife. Now this Muslim farmer, he was the son of the great Sahabi. He was the son of the great companion Abu Dharr al-Ghifari. So the son of Abu Dharr, who was a farmer, and his wife, they were there on the farm at that time when the army from Ghatafan arrived. So they killed the farmer. They killed the son of Abu Dharr and they took his wife as their captive, as a prisoner. And then they took the animals, of course, they took the, the camels and the sheep, and they fled. They were not interested in going into Medina and fighting the people of Medina. No, they were just interesting in, interested in stealing what they could and going back. So they took these animals, and they took this woman as their captive, and they fled back towards their land. So the other farmers who were around the area, they became aware of what happened. And they quickly went to Medina, to the city, to inform the people what had happened. Salama ibn al-Akwa radiallahu an. He called out, Wa sabaha, wa sabaha. This was a call of distress, like something has happened and we need help. So he called out and then he told one of the farmers, go into Medina and inform the Muslims what had happened. And I'm going to run after these people on foot. So Salama ibn al-Aqwa, he didn't want to go into Medina himself and inform the people because he wanted to actually uh, chase the people, of the, the soldiers from Ghatafan as fast as he could. Now Salama ibn al-Aqwa, he was very well known. He was a great fighter, a great warrior amongst the Sahaba. And he was actually known as the best fighter on foot. The best soldier or the best warrior of the Sahaba who would fight on foot. The Prophet وسلم, said, خَيْرُ فُرْسَانِنَا أَبُوْ قَتَادَ وَخَيْرُ رِجَالَاتِنَا سَلَمَ إِبْنَ الْأَكْوَعَ The Prophet وسلم, said, the best of our fighters on horse, the best of our horsemen is Abu Qatada. And the best of our foot fighters, our foot soldiers, the best of them is Salama ibn al-Akwa. So he was a very good fighter on foot. And he was very, very fast. This was something that he was well known for, his speed. He could run extremely fast. And whenever he would race with anybody, he would always win the race. And it was said that he could even beat horses in race. If he would race with a horse, he could actually even beat a horse in race. That's how fast this man was. So he ran after the invaders on foot. 
So when the news reached Medina that these soldiers from Ghatafan had come and they had killed one of the Muslim farmers and they had taken his wife as a captive and they fled with these camels and these animals and they're going back to Ghatafan. When this news reached Medina, the Prophet ﷺ gathered the people and he quickly prepared a cavalry of about 200 men under the leadership of Sa'd ibn Zayd radiallahu anhu and he sent them ahead quickly. 200 men to go quickly. And the Prophet ﷺ stayed back to make more preparations for a bigger force to follow them. But he wanted to send 200 people quickly and in the meantime, he would prepare a bigger force and they would follow. So the Prophet ﷺ sent these 200 men ahead under the leadership of Sa'd ibn Zayd while the Prophet ﷺ stayed back and he prepared a bigger army of 700 people to follow them. And the reason why the Prophet ﷺ wanted to make such big preparations because this is the tribe of Ghatafan. Ghatafan, it's a huge, big tribe. So the Prophet ﷺ knew that they would need as much manpower as they could get. So now, if you, if you think about it, there are actually three groups chasing these people from Ghatafan. There are three groups. The first group is made up of one man, Salama ibn al Aqwa. And then the second group is these 200 people under the leadership of Sa'ad ibn Zayd. And then the third group is the main army led by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And he has 700 soldiers with him. So of course the first to reach these people was Salama ibn al Aqwa. So when he reached them, he started shooting at them with arrows. He had some arrows with him and he started shooting at them with arrows. And then when they tried to come back and chase him, he would run away and he would hide. And then when they couldn't find him, they would move forward again and then he would go back after the, them again and start shooting them again with arrows. Then they would turn back and try to chase him, but he was too fast for them. He would run away and he would hide. So this kept going on for some time. Then they realized like, look, he's trying to shoot us, but then when we try to come after him, you know, we can't find him. So it looks like what he's doing is just a distraction. He's trying to slow us down. And the reason why he's trying to slow us down, it must mean that there is an army behind him. And he's trying to make sure that we don't get too far ahead so that that army can come and catch up with us. So this was the thinking of Fuzara ibn Uyayna, the head of this army. And he was right, actually. This was his thinking. So what he decided to do is he sent the army ahead. He sent the army with all of the the spoils with the animals and everything he sent them ahead and he decided to stay back himself along with his own brother Habib ibn Uyayna ibn Hassan and two more men so Fuzara and his brother Habib and two more men they stayed back to block Salama and they sent the rest of the army ahead so now Salama cannot move forward because these four men are distracting him are not are not letting him move forward and the army the rest of the army is able to move forward. So this was the strategy of Fuzara ibn Uyayna, the, the head of this army. So now in the meantime, the group of 200 Muslim cavalrymen, they caught up with Salama. They arrived and they caught up with Salama and these four guys from Ghatafan are there as well. Fuzara and Habib and the two other guys who were trying to block Salama. So now the 200 men that the Prophet ﷺ quickly sent, they have arrived as well. And amongst these 200 men is Abu Qatada. And Abu Qatada, as we mentioned, he was the greatest knight of the Muslim fighters. He was the best fighter, the best warrior of the Muslims who would fight on horse. So Abu Qatada, he went towards those four men and he killed Habib ibn Uyayna. He killed Habib ibn Uyayna, the brother of Fuzara and the son of that the leader of the tribe, Habib ibn Uyayna, was also the son of Uyayna ibn Hassan, who is the head of the whole tribe of Ghatafan. So now the, the son of the leader, one of the sons of the leader, has died. So now, after he killed Habib ibn Uyayna, the other three, they ran away. Because this is a big cavalry. It's about 200 Muslims. And these are only four guys here. So they knew that they were vastly outnumbered. One of them was killed, Habib. So the other three, they fled and they ran away. Now when Abu Qatada killed Habib ibn Uyayna, he took off his own 
outer garment and he put it on the body of Habib ibn Uyayna. Basically to mark this body and the spoils on this body, the shield and the armor and whatever he has, Abu Qatada wanted to mark that as his own. Because in war, when someone kills another person in war, that person who killed has the right to take the, the spoils from that person. So whatever armor he may have had, whatever shield he may have had, his sword or whatever he may have had with him, that belongs to the person who killed him. And this is from a hadith of the Prophet وسلم, where he said, Man qatala qatilan, lahu alayhi bayina, falahu salabu. So whoever kills someone in war, that person has the right to take whatever the, the killed person has on him. So he has the right to take his armor and his, his shield and his sword and whatever he may have had on him. So Abu Qatada had a right to all of this from Habib ibn Uyayna. But he didn't have time to actually take all that stuff because he wanted to chase the other three who had just run away. So in order to mark it so that this belongs to Abu Qatada, the spoils from Habib ibn Uyayna belong to Abu Qatada, he took off his outer garment and he covered the body of Habib ibn Uyayna with this so that it would be known that whatever comes from this person, it belongs to Abu Qatada. So he didn't have time to wait and he, he continued on to chase the, the other three people who had fled. Now eventually, after some time, the Prophet wasallam and the main army with 700 people, they reached that area as well. So now when the Sahaba, they saw this dead body there and they saw the garment of Abu Qatada on the body. So what do you think they thought? They thought, oh, Abu Qatada has been killed. We recognize this garment of Abu Qatada. This is a dead body on the ground. This is Abu Qatada. He has been killed. And they said, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. And the Prophet wasallam said, no, this is not Abu Qatada. Rather, this is someone who was killed by Abu Qatada. And that was before they even uncovered his face. But the Prophet wasallam he knew. He was informed by revelation that this is not Abu Qatada, rather this is someone who was killed by Abu Qatada. And when they lifted the garment, they saw that in fact it was not Abu Qatada, rather it was Habib ibn Uyayna ibn Hisn. So this was also from the, the miracles of the Prophet wasallam that he was informed of this without even seeing it. So now that the main army has arrived and the Prophet wasallam has arrived, Salama, he goes to the Prophet wasallam and he says, Ya Rasulullah, give me 100 of your men. Give me 100 of these men, I will go and I will chase them and I will defeat them, Ya Rasulullah. And then the Prophet says, Ya Salama, they have reached their homes, they have reached their dwellings. So there's no use for us to continue this. So the Prophet ordered for the Muslims to return back to Al Madina. So these soldiers from Ghatafan, they eventually reached their homeland. They returned back to their homeland and they had these camels and they had this woman who they had captured as a prisoner. Remember, they captured the daughter-in-law of Abu Dhar. So she was there as their prisoner. Now she was able to get loose and she was able to jump on one of those camels that they had stolen from Medina. And it happened to be that this particular camel that she was able to get on it was a camel that belonged to the Prophet ﷺ himself. So she was able to get on that camel and she was able to escape. But she didn't know the way back to Al Madina. So she made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya Allah, guide this camel to the right path and let it take me back to Al Madina. So the camel started moving very fast without her directing it. So she was very happy. Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had answered her dua and the camel is on its way back to al Madina. So she was so happy that she made a vow. She said, Ya Allah, if this camel returns me safely back to al Madina, out of thankfulness to you, Ya Allah, I will slaughter this camel. I will sacrifice this camel, Ya Allah. Now remember, this camel, it doesn't even belong to her. This is the camel of the Prophet ﷺ. But she's so happy that she makes this vow. And eventually the camel reached Medina and she returned to Medina safely. Walhamdulillah. So she told the Prophet ﷺ about the whole incident, how she escaped and how she made this vow. 
She said, Ya Rasulullah, I made this vow that if this camel brings me safely back, that I will slaughter it as a show of my gratefulness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to her, Bi'sa ma jazaytiha. Like what a bad way to, re to reward this camel for helping you out. This camel saved you and as a reward for the camel saving you, you're going to kill it? How can you do such a thing? And then he said, also, this camel doesn't even belong to you. It's not your camel. How can you make a vow that you will sacrifice this camel if it doesn't even belong to you? You cannot make a vow to give something or to sacrifice something that doesn't even belong to you. So the Prophet ﷺ canceled that vow and the camel was saved, alhamdulillah. Also in this period, the period following Al-Khandaq, there was another expedition known as the expedition of Dhil Qassa. And this expedition was to the tribe of Bani Tha'laba under the command of Muhammad ibn Maslama. So Bani Tha'laba, that was one of the tribes also that had participated with the confederation at the battle of Al-Khandaq. So see the Prophet ﷺ is sending expeditions. He's punishing all of those tribes who participated in that confederation. So Bani Tha'laba was one of the tribes that participated in the confederation. So the Prophet ﷺ sent a group of 10 people under the command of Muhammad ibn Maslama not to fight Bani Tha'laba, not at this point to fight them, but uh, as basically an intelligence gathering mission. So go towards Bani Tha'laba, see their situation, gather some intelligence, and then later on they could go and invade them. So this was not a mission to actually fight them, but it was actually a mission just to gather intelligence. So the Prophet ﷺ put Muhammad ibn Maslama in charge of 10 people to go, go towards Bani Tha'laba. Now Bani Tha'laba, they were afraid. They had seen, yes, that the Prophet ﷺ is sending expeditions out to fight all of those tribes who participated in the Battle of Al-Khandaq. So they knew that their turn was going to come eventually. So they were on very high alert and they had their intelligence all over the place. So when they realized that these 10 men are coming towards Bani Tha'laba, they quickly sent 100 soldiers to fight against Muhammad ibn Maslama and these 10 men. Way before they even reached near the area of Bani Tha'laba. So Muhammad ibn Maslama and these 10 men, they were not expecting it because they hadn't even come close to Bani Tha'laba yet. But then these 100 men from the tribe of Bani Tha'laba, they just attacked them and they were caught off guard. So these people from Bani Tha'laba, they killed the whole group of Muhammad ibn Maslama. They killed nine of them and they actually injured Muhammad ibn Maslama as well. And they thought that they killed him as well. He was bleeding and he pretended to be dead. And they, they checked him and they kicked, his, they kicked his foot to see if he's going to move. He didn't move. So they assumed that he was dead as well. So they killed nine of them and they left Muhammad ibn Maslama for dead as well. They thought he was dead, but he really wasn't dead. And then they took whatever weapons and whatever supplies that group of Muslims had and they went back to their dwellings. They went back to the land of, of Bani Tha'laba. So Muhammad ibn Maslama, he's injured, he's bleeding and he's pretending to be dead because he doesn't know who's still around, who's watching. So he has to play dead. He has to pretend to be dead. And he pretended to be dead for a long time. Then he heard someone around the area. And he's still pretending to be dead because he doesn't know who this is. But then he heard a person in the area and he saw these dead bodies. And this man said, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. So when Muhammad ibn Maslama heard this person saying, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon, he knew that this is a Muslim. So then he opened his eyes and he said, Look, I'm not dead. Help me. So they helped him and they took him back to al Madina, and they treated him and Alhamdulillah, he recovered in al Madina. So after this happened, the Prophet Sallallahu he sent another expedition to Bani Tha'laba and this one was to go and fight them. And this was under the leadership of Abu Ubaidah Amir ibn al-Jarrah radiallahu anhu. He sent this group under the leadership, leadership of Abu Ubaidah to go and invade uh, Bani Tha'laba to take revenge for what they did at Khandaq and also what they did to the group of Muhammad ibn Maslama. 
So this time Bani Thalaba was not able to resist, so they ran away. And Abu Ubaidah and his army were able to take the animals and supplies that Bani Thalaba had. And they also managed to take one prisoner, one captive, and they returned back to Al Madinah with these ghanaim, with these spoils of the war. Now, this captive who was taken back to Medina from Bani Thalaba, after some time, Alhamdulillah, he became a Muslim, he accepted Islam, Alhamdulillah. So, as you can see, after the Battle of Khandaq, it was a time of constant battles and constant confrontations, and this is going on and on and on, one after another. But still, even though the Muslims were fighting with all of these different tribes, the main enemy, the main enemy was still Quraysh, right? So the Prophet wasallam knew that the Quraysh is still enemy number one. So he wanted to do something to weaken the economy of the Quraysh. Do something to hurt the Quraysh economically. Because if the economy of a tribe becomes weak, then the tribe will become weak in all different aspects. And its military will also become weak. So this was the plan of the Prophet wasallam to hurt the Quraysh economically. So the Prophet wasallam he prepared an army of 170 men under the companion, under the command of Zayd uh, ibn al-Haritha radiallahu anhu. Zayd ibn al-Haritha was someone who was very deeply beloved to the Prophet wasallam. So he put this expedition under the command of Zayd ibn al-Haritha radiallahu anhu and he dispatched them to an area known as Al-Is. Now Al-Is was a distance of four days away from al Madinah, four days towards the north. And it was an area where there was a caravan of the Quraysh coming back from Syria. It was going to pass through this area known as Al-Is. So the Prophet wasallam sent Zayd ibn al-Haritha and this, this expedition of 170 men to go and to ambush that caravan. So this was an area, Al-Is was an area that had lots of mountains, it had lots of trees, and it had lots of caves as well. So it was such a place that it would be easy to hide in this area. It's a place that's easy to use as a hiding place. So Zayd, he was very intelligent. Zayd, instead of going and attacking the caravan directly, you know, if you go and you attack the caravan directly, they would have a chance to run away. Some of them actually probably would have the opportunity to escape, right? If you attack them directly. So Zayd, he had a plan. He's, he wanted to take advantage of this area. This is an area with mountains. It's an, it's an area with lots of caves. It's an area where we can hide. So he decided that we will hide in these caves. We'll just hide in these caves. So when the caravan passes through here, we will jump on them and there will be no opportunity for them to escape. So this was the strategic planning of Zayd ibn al-Haritha radiallahu anhu. So they hid in those caves. Now the caravan of the Quraysh, it's coming back from Asham, it's coming back from Syria. And of course it has its security. It has someone in the front making sure that the coast is clear, right? And then they would move forward. So it looked like the coast was clear. Even when they were passing through Al-Is, it looked like, yes, the coast is clear because they didn't realize that these Muslims are hiding in the caves. So when they passed through Al-Is, then Zayd ibn al-Haritha and the soldiers, they came out and they ambushed that caravan. And they took everything in that caravan and they imprisoned everyone. They took everyone as a captive and no one was able to escape. Now this caravan, it was led by Abu al-As ibn al-Rabi'ah. And who is Abu al-As ibn al-Rabi'ah? If you, if you remember, we spoke about him before. He was the husband of Zainab bint Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abu al-As ibn al-Rabi'ah was the husband of Zainab, the daughter of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And if you remember Abu al-As, he was also taken as a prisoner at the Battle of Badr. He was taken as a, as a prisoner at the Battle of Badr. And Zainab radiallahu anha, she sent her necklace as a ransom for him. So when this necklace arrived, the Sahaba, they freed Abu al-As and they also returned the necklace to Zainab out of respect to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and his daughter. 
But the Prophet وسلم, took a promise from Abu Al As that yes, we will release you, we will let you go. On the day of Badr, this is, we will let you go, but you have to give permission to my daughter that she can leave Mecca and she can make hijrah to Al Madina. So Abu Al As he gave the Prophet وسلم, his word, and after the Battle of Badr, he returned back to Mecca and he told his wife, he told Zainab, You are free, you can go and make hijrah to your father. Go and make hijrah to Al Madina. And Zainab, عنها, she left Mecca and she made hijrah to Medina. So he kept his word. He made a promise to the Prophet وسلم, and he kept that promise. So even though he wasn't a Muslim, he had that sense of honor that if I make a promise, I will keep my promise. So this happened a couple of years, a few years back at the Battle of Badr. Now, just a few years later, Abu Al As is coming back from Syria. He is in charge of this caravan of the Quraysh and he is captured by Zayd ibn al-Haritha and this group of Muslims. So they come back to al Madina, and the prisoners are tied inside the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ. This is how they used to handle the prisoners. They would be tied up in the masjid so that they could see the interactions of the Muslims. They could hear the recitation of the Quran. This was also a form of da'wah even for the prisoners. So now when Zainab heard that her husband was one of the captives. Her husband was one of the prisoners. She wanted to give him her protection. So at the time of Salat al-Fajr, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he started the Salah. He said, Allahu Akbar. And the Muslims behind him, they also said, Allahu Akbar. Zainab was there as well. But before she started her Salah, the Muslims had all started their Salah. But before Zainab did her Takbir, she said, Ajartu Abul As. I have given Abul As my protection. He is under my protection. And nobody could reply at that time because everyone was in Salah. The Prophet ﷺ heard it. He heard his daughter say these words, but he was in the middle of Salah, so he couldn't respond. After he finished Salat al Fajr, he turned to his companions and he said, Hal sami'tum ma sami't? Did you hear what I heard? And they said, Naam, Ya Rasulullah, we heard it, Ya Rasulullah. And then the Prophet ﷺ said to his companions, nafsi ma alimtu hadha. I didn't know about this. I had no idea about this. She didn't say anything about this to me, and I had no, about, no idea about this. So he wanted to clarify to his companions that he didn't have some secret conversation with his daughter to give protection to her husband. No, it's nothing like this. She did this on her own. So he said to his companions, uh, Wallahi, I swear by Allah, I, I had no idea about this. So Zainab, she gave this promise of protection to Abu Al-As, so it was fulfilled. He was under her protection. So Zainab, radiallahu anha, she asked the Prophet, وسلم, Ya Rasulullah, can you return his money back to him? The wealth that he has, can you return that back to him? And then the Prophet ﷺ, he consulted his companions about this. He said to his companions that, you know the position of this man, Abu Al-As, you know, in my family. He is the husband of my daughter. So if you want to return his money to him, then we will be grateful for that. But if you don't want to return his money to him, then that is your right. And you have a right to that money. So the Prophet ﷺ didn't push them to make a decision to give him back the money. He said, if you want to do it, we'll be happy with that. But if you don't want to do it, if you want to keep that, then that is your absolute right to keep it. This is the right that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. But the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they had so much love and honor and respect for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that they said to him, Ya Rasulullah, we are happy to give him back his money. So they gave him back his money. And Abu al-As was very grateful for this. And he also asked, after they gave him back his money, he said to them, I also have some amanat, some trusts that the Quraysh has entrusted me with. So will you give me permission to return those trusts to the people? And the Sahaba, they said, we will give you the, the opportunity to return those trusts to the Quraysh. And out of an honor, for Zainab and her father, Rasulullah because of your position with them, 
to honor them, we will release you and we will release all of the prisoners. All of the prisoners are free to go. And this is out of respect to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and his daughter. So Abu al-As was so impressed by this and he was so grateful for this to see. Look at these manners, look at this integrity, look at the character of these people. So he was very impressed and Islam entered his heart at that time. But he didn't say anything publicly. So he went back to Mecca and he returned the trusts of the people to them. And after he returned everything, he said to the people of the Quraysh, have I fulfilled all of my obligations to you? Have I returned all of your amanat, all of your trust to you? And they said, yes, we bear witness that you have returned everything to us and you have fulfilled your obligations towards us. So once he had gotten this off of his neck, once he had fulfilled all of these obligations, then he said to them, he said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad rasulullah I bear witness that there is no one worthy of worship except Allah and I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is the messenger of Allah. Then he went back to al Madina as a Muslim, alhamdulillah, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa returned him back to his wife and he lived back with his wife Zainab radiallahu anha as a Muslim, walhamdulillah. So this family was reunited, alhamdulillah. Zainab radiallahu anha was reunited with her husband Abu al-As alhamdulillah as a Muslim. So this is a very good uh, ending for this uh, story alhamdulillah. So these are some of the events that took place after the battle of al-Khandaq and there are still a few more events that took place and inshallah we will continue to discuss this and talk about this next week bi idhnillah. Wallahu a'lam wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.